freshman year of high school. I had just been rejected from the school play, and our comedy club was recruiting all the rejects. And let me tell you, I didn't have the slightest idea what they were doing. I soon found out that improv, or improvisational comedy, is a team sport. You don't really do improv by yourself. In that aspect, it's kind of like singing in the middle of the street. One person doing it, and you think they're deranged, but you find a group of people doing it, and suddenly you're in an episode of Glee. <laughs> so, an improv scene. You get a couple of actors on stage, and you give them a suggestion. The suggestion can be a location, a relationship, an object, an occupation. The possibilities are endless. From the suggestion, the actors create an entire scene, like you would see in a play, but with no script. Unlike this TED talk. <laughs> but usually, improv is hilarious because the form lends itself into creating surprising connections that in turn get a laugh. I'd always been really interested in acting, but I was never really one for comedy. I never watched Saturday Night Live or stand up specials or was even the funny one among my friends. I was serious, I hated change, I was a workaholic, and to top it all off, I thought the world was out to get me. But improv is the opposite of everything I was. And in time, I did what everyone thought was impossible. I learned how to be funny. <laughs> or at least, I think I did. More importantly, I learned how to use the pillars of improv to lead me through my own life. Here are the four main pillars of improv. One, yes and. Improv demands that the actor love change. In improv, saying no is like breaking, just as you were riding a bicycle. And just as you begin to ride the scene, as you break in the, in the beginning, you are breaking as you're beginning to pedal. It's an obstacle for the scene because it keeps you from moving forward. You spend all this excess energy stopping and going and stopping and going again. You could be moving forward in the scene, but you find yourself stuck. So what does yes and entail? Yes and means when your partner says, hey, this is a cat. You go, yeah, that is a cat. Not, no, you dummy. That's a bar of soap. This is important because you have to say yes to the world you are given. When you don't, the scene makes no progress and you spend all this excess energy fighting each other and not building anything. Which brings me to my second point, and. And means you build. So the cat is a cat, but the cat is also my mom reincarnated. The next pillar is two, follow the fear. Improv is scary. Being funny and improv comes from using the element of surprise and connection to make a joke. And to be surprising, you have to do things that the audience doesn't expect. And sometimes that means doing things that you don't expect. The best scenes come from doing something that scares you. So if you're afraid of acting like a cat, then embody a cat and go full out. If you're scared of asking out that boy in a scene because he might think that you have a thing for him, just go all out and marry him and have his baby. <laughs> in the scene, got us. <laughs> this is important because we have to say yes to the world we are given. And great things come from following the fear because at the end of the day, there are no mistakes and everything can be seen as a gift. Which brings me to three. There are no mistakes, only gifts. Now, I understand that doing embarrassing things in front of an audience of people is intimidating to say the least. Doubt can start flooding your mind and you might think, oh my god, I just made the biggest mistake of my entire life. Oh no, I can't believe I just asked him out of that last scene. He's going to think I'm so weird. Nobody likes me. I'm not even funny. Why am I even here? There are no mistakes, only gifts. You can do anything and it will be the right move in the long run. Though the ending you come to may not be the one you had in mind when you initiated the scene, you have to have a positive mindset and believe that wherever the scene takes you is where you are always meant to be. Don't shrink and stop trying if something doesn't get a laugh. Learn from it. Doubt in yourself or doubt in your partners can kill a scene. 
That's why it's so important that we trust ourselves and our partners on stage with us of their ideas and that everything will work out in the end. Four, make eye contact because we're in this together. Before every show in the green room, we pat each other on the back and say, I got your back. Because unlike other forms of comedy and performances, improv requires trust above all else. Trust not only in yourself, but in the partners on stage with you. That's why in a scene, we're constantly making eye contact with each other and checking in. It is very easy to be caught up in the lights, in the laughs, in the stage of it all. But at the end of the day, those aren't the things that matters. Your partner is what matters above all the rules and the guidelines of the craft. The jokes are just a side effect of a great connection between two improv actors. And improv actors are judged by how good they make their partners look. So, the first rule of improv is accepting the world you live in. Yes, and, remember? Once you accept it fully, then you can add to it. I found this particularly very compelling in my own life because in the fall of my sophomore year of high school, my stepmom, Lorena, started dying. A very difficult thing to say yes and to. I knew she had stage four breast cancer since the day I met her. And after eight years of her illness accelerating, it was not a surprise when she quickly began deteriorating. But it was also not pleasant by any means. And to top it all off, my mom was in Houston. My dad had just recently moved to LA for work and I was alone in Chicago with Lorena. It was just me and my stepmom. Oh, you thought this was gonna be like a fun and lighthearted TED talk about improv? Sorry, no, but the next one's kind of lighter, so <laughs> bear with me. I will not deny to you that it was a scary situation. I mean, she was slowly dying right before my eyes. The scariest moment for me was not when I was told she wasn't gonna make it another year, because words are just words. But among the truly most terrifying moments were when all eyes were on me, there was no script on how to take care of Lorna, and feeling completely alone while watching someone die. I was lugging oxygen tanks up and down the stairs because there was no one else in the house to do it. On multiple occasions, I saw her on the floor pulling at her skin because she was so fed up with living. She was begging for death. And as a 15-year-old, I had no idea how to deal with that. Hell, most of the people in this room would not know how to deal with that. So I used what I knew to help me get through this difficult situation. I treated it like a very depressing improv scene. Yes, Anne taught me to come to terms with the fact that she was indeed going to die. Follow the fear taught me to do whatever I could around the house to help, even though I very much was afraid. Whether that was making dinner, even though she could barely eat, or slowly walking up and down the halls with her so she wouldn't be in bed rest all day, or even just sitting down and cracking a joke with her to make her smile. There are no mistakes, only gifts taught me to stop questioning my circumstances and believe that everything happens for a reason that it'll all work out in the end. And in more general terms, you can use these pillars of improv in any situation you find yourself in, from the everyday bumps in the road to the, well, to put it simply, life or death situations. Now I am up here and the spotlight is on me and I'm telling you how to live your life like some almighty comedy martyr. Well, this martyr didn't always live up to these improv rules. At school, I became very distant, and I often didn't talk to my friends about what was happening at home with Lerna. My friends thought I was isolating them, and they were right. All of this stemmed from fear. Fear that I would be a different person to them if I showed them I was scared. Fear that everything I was doing was a mistake, and they would judge me for it. And then I realized this withdrawal from people 
was unhelpful for two main reasons. One, I was saying no instead of saying yes to my situation by denying it. And two, I was not making eye contact with people. In fact, I very much was just pushing them out of my life. And though it was hard, and though it took me some time to actually do it, I finally opened back up to my friends and told them about their own. They made me laugh to make me happy, but also let me cry and held my hand when there was nothing else I could do. And then I got a call from my dad. Lorena was about to die. I rushed to the hospice care center and the woman I saw was not my stepmom. She was so sedated she couldn't talk. A collection of bones because she refused to eat or maybe just couldn't. I was sitting alone in a room with her and she was barely breathing. And then she passed away. You know, in improv they say, don't kill your scene partners. But maybe they should say, hey scene partners, don't die in the middle of a scene. No one likes that joke, but once you write it, <laughs> it stays in. Though it was hard, I made it to lights out with Lorena, and I did it with my eyes open. And I had an entire ensemble ready in Chicago to help me start the grandest scene of all. What happens next? Yes, Lorena had just died. And I was still alive. Then my best friend Savannah called me up and said, hey, I have an extra room in my house that nobody's using. Do you want to move in with me so you can stay in Chicago? I had nowhere else to go, and suddenly a new family opened their arms to me. I still had a family. My family had gotten smaller, but also larger. I opened up to Savannah as she was the closest to a sister I had ever had, and her family would become a part of what I would call my own. I was in one of the darkest moments of my life, and I found light in comedy. I was heavily involved at improv at school with Savannah. On the weekends, I would go to stand-up and improv classes. In the spring, I was cast in an improv ensemble at the Second City. I did stand-up with comedians from Saturday Night Live, all with my favorite comedy partner, Savannah, by my side. And I made eye contact so I wouldn't lose sight of what was really important. I did the most with the cards I was given, and I chased the funny to keep me from drowning in death and mourning. In the end, improv saved me. At 16, I went through what no one should have to go through, but what everyone at some point does. So, if you never want to do comedy in your life, go in the same, it is a lot of fun. I do hope you do improv. Or well, use the pillars of improv in your own lives. And I hope you take away at least these four things. One, say yes to your situation instead of spending all your energy denying your circumstances. Instead, use that energy to add to your situation and make it better. Two, there are no mistakes, only gifts. No matter how you add to your situation is the right move in the long term. Add to your situation, and if it ends up being the wrong move, just realize that it is a gift in the form of an unexpected opportunity. Three, follow the fear. Things are scary. Life is scary. And life is hard. But some of the best moves you will ever make are the ones that you never thought you would. And if it scares you, try to understand why and then push past it and take that leap of faith. And four, above all else, make eye contact because we're in this together. Life is like improv. There's no script. People are watching. And it can get scary when you get caught up in the lights and the laughs and the stage of it all. 
But everything becomes easy when you realize your partners have your back, you have their back, and your partners will never let you fail. You know, in my industry, they say time plus tragedy equals comedy. And 